turned out the ideas I was working on in the 70s, it was, it was a very unique way of making a solar cell, but it turned out it gave very good voltage output from the solar cells. And um, uh, the people that were funding the research at that stage, um, you know, NASA Lewis Research Labs was interested for space applications and so on, but they believed that increasing the voltage of the cell was the way to improve the efficiency of the silicon cells. So the work we were doing became um, uh, you know, recognised because we were making progress in this area that no one else was making much progress. And, and that got us onto the path of um, actually converting these improved voltages to improved efficiency. But when the first cells were made, people did a lot of analyses and they said 20% is as far as you're ever going to get in efficiency. So that became sort of the four minute mile of the area. So we, we put a lot of effort into trying to be the first to get to 20% efficiency, which we did in 1985. We looked at the same time at ways that we could transfer some of those improvements into simple commercial sequences. And then we developed the very contact cell as a consequence of that. And, and that cell went into production in about 1991, and uh, it's still the, the main um, um, type of cell that's made by BP Solar in Europe. So it's still um, you know, very much alive and kicking. The next generation is thin films. So again, you can use um, um, silicon as thin films, but there's a range of other materials you can use. Like silicon is probably the only semiconductor that would be cheap enough to use in wafer form. You know, anything else, like if you're looking at gallium arsenide or you know, any of these other compound semiconductors, they'd just be too expensive. But um, once you go to thin films, you can start thinking about any materials. Like you could use gold as your solar cell. If people are using um, materials like cadmium telluride and, and tellurium, for example, is as scarce as gold. And you know, if the industry grows and you need as much tellurium as you, as you need gold, I think you're going to be looking at fairly similar costs. So it'll test out the theory of whether you could actually use gold in a cell or not. Um, but in our work, we um, concentrated on trying to um, develop a thin film silicon cell because it's very robust and it's non-toxic and after oxygen it's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust so you know it's a really good choice for a number of reasons. So we had developed a lot of expertise with silicon thin films and we thought it was an ideal material. Some of the other thin films sort of look good on paper but when you started looking at things like tellurium availability or the toxicity of cadmium and so on, you're introducing other issues that we didn't think you really needed to introduce and in a perfect world you wouldn't be introducing. So, you know, we went straight for the jugular and, and tried to develop a silicon. The company's trying to introduce thin film product at the moment and there's only been one that's been successful so far and that's been First Solar with cadmium telluride based product which you know, I have some um, reservations about, as I've indicated. Um, but it's been very difficult for the other thin films to um, break into production, partly because the, the present crystalline wafers uh, present such a strong technology. It's very difficult for a new technology to compete in terms of durability and ruggedness and costs and so on. So you have to be up to quite large production volumes before you become competitive, but then you have to have some way of getting to those production volumes, so it's a chicken and egg type of situation. We're in production, but we haven't reached the stage yet where it's guaranteed that we're going to steam past what the um, people working with wafers are doing. So, um, you know, the next couple of years are going to be quite uh, crucial for a lot of the thin films technologies, including the ones we've been working on. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of challenges getting new technology onto the market and, and, and there seems to be no easy path. All the thin film companies are having to battle to, to get the bugs out of the technology and the, uh, and the equipment that you, it's often new manufacturing equipment that's used and that introduces its own challenge because the companies making the equipment aren't experienced and equipment has to work 24 hours around the clock, you know, for five or ten years. So it's not trivial to develop equipment that'll do that from scratch. Like the, the wafer technology has had um, you know, the benefit of 30 years to iron out the bugs and get things streamlined. And you know, things were pretty rough in the early years with that technology as well. So very difficult to introduce new technology against such a strong player as the crystalline uh, silicon wafer technology. You know, that's been the challenge, to get, to get a technology to the stage that people are willing to invest the type of money that's required to get to those production volumes. With the wafer, wafers, it's a bit of a no-brainer. If you put the money in with the market growing as rapidly as it is, you're, you're likely to get a return. Whereas with the thin film technologies, there's a lot more risk involved because the technology isn't mature. But that doesn't mean a lot of people aren't trying. So <laughs> there's at least a dozen thin film companies trying very hard to get technology on the market as we, as we speak. 
So, so, so far, you know, there's been two or three. That, well, first, solar has clearly been successful, and then there's two or three, including the company that I'm involved with, that are in the throes of becoming successful. And then there's a couple of dozen others that still have um, a lot more work to do before they get to the stage that the rest are at. At the moment, photovoltaics is targeting a niche market in that it's the retail electricity market. So unlike things like wind um, energy where you have to compete just with you know, bulk electricity, in photovoltaics you can put it on the roof of your home or your office or your, or your um, uh, business or whatever and you can generate electricity right at the point of use. So you're competing with the, uh, the supplier of electricity, so you're competing with the retail cost of electricity, whereas if you're a wind generator, the value of the electricity you produce is a lot less because you're competing on the wholesale electricity market. And you know there's at least a factor of three and maybe as high as a factor of 10 difference between the retail value of electricity and the um, wholesale value. So you know, photovoltaics is unique, and like a lot of people say, photovoltaics is so much more expensive than wind. But they they miss this point that they're competing in different markets, so that they don't they've got their cost structures and cost requirements are different. So I believe you need to make a transition from wafers to thin films for photovoltaics to make any impact at all on the large energy scene. You know, like there's all kinds of niche markets and it'll be quite a useful technology regardless of whether it makes that transition or not. But if it's, say, stuck with wafers, it's limited to niche, um, you know, retail electricity markets, whereas I think the technology ultimately can, you know, compete in the bulk electricity market or the bulk energy market and um, that's what we've been aiming to do. Probably energy storage is the biggest flaw that, you know, the biggest hurdle that has to be overcome if you're going to supply like 60% of your total energy supply from uh, photovoltaics. And there's been a German study by a group of highly respected people that have produced this forecast that that type of scenario is technically feasible, whereby, you know, you get rid of burning coal and oil and whatever, and by the end of this century, you supply 60% of your primary energy by photovoltaics. But to be able to do that, you need some type of storage. So that's probably the the, the, the biggest mix, missing link. But in terms of environmental issue, there doesn't really seem to be um, any showstoppers. The, the financial engineering aspects is something that's been very interesting, um, and particularly in the US is where you know a lot of the initiatives have come from. So um, no, that's been quite interesting. So that's the advantage of getting a broader community interested. You get new ideas that you know the, the technical photovoltaic technical community wouldn't have thought of themselves. But yeah, there's things like power purchase agreements that are being promoted in the US that are that look like it'll be a very good vehicle for um, propagating the, the use of photovoltaics, which then means it'll it'll help bring down the manufacturing costs and so on. So that's really interesting and it's hard to imagine how the photovoltaic industry could be growing any more quickly um, than what it is. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see the thin film technology that we're working on become as successful as uh, First Solar has been with their, first, their thin film technology. And, uh, you know, I, I believe it is important that you know, a, a long-term sustainable thin film does reach um, maturity for the future of the industry. If we stay, stay stuck with wafers, I think we're stuck to a small niche market applications indefinitely. So yeah, I'd like to see, um, you know, a sustainable thin film um, reach market maturity and, um, you know, it'd be great if it was ours that did that.